Hi, this is John Harter, and welcome to episode 7 of Valleys of Numenor. The men of the Southlands are in danger, and the Numenorians come to the rescue. But things don't quite go as planned as Mount Doom erupts, signaling the coming of an even greater evil. But will we finally get to see who's behind all this? Episode 7, The Lady in Red, Ashes. Charlotte is back directing, and this episode is written by Jason Cahill, who also did Adar. As my title suggests, the episode's actually called The Eye, we'll get to that later, we open on Galadriel covered in ashes and everything around her is on fire, including a horse. I hope they use CGI for that. The eruption of Mount Doom has wiped the entire village out. She calls out for Halbrand or Elendil, but in response gets Theo yelling for his mother. Nearby, Isildur is trying to get Valendil out from underneath the fallen roof. He and the queen lift the roof to get him out and find their friend Antamo dead underneath. They reach a nearby house to rescue more people trapped inside. The men lift the roof bangs up and Muriel rushes in to save the people. She leaves them out, but the building collapses, spraying her in the face with embers and burying Isildur. Meanwhile, the Harfoots and the Giant finally reach the grove where they thought they'd find their nice glade with all sorts of fruits and vegetables and everything nice and shiny. Instead, they find it burned to the ground and the land scorched. Sadok says his grandfather told them about mountains that spit fire when a new evil was approaching. The trees they were hoping to get food from are all wiped out. So they figured to ask the giant. He beat up wolves. Why not make a tree grow? Sounds like a reasonable assumption. In Casa Doom, Elrond asks King Doran for his help in getting the Mithril. In return, they'll offer the dwarves certain things for a set period of time. Sure, it's 500 years, but they're going to save your existence. How about lifting the time limit? He ends up literally on his knees begging the king, even giving him a leaf with the black stuff on it. Durin the third has everyone leave so he can talk to Durin the fourth. The king tells his son he just can't do it, that digging for Mithril may end up creating a greater calamity than the elves dying. Well, not greater for the elves, but... The king feels bad about it, but the elves gotta go, they gotta go. Disa is not happy about this, wondering if they should just go and reopen the mine to show it's no big deal. Elrond comes in and he says he must leave to tell Gilgalad the bad news. He gives the Mithril back to Durin and says not quite goodbye, but a little more than farewell, that kind of thing. The prince tosses the Mithril across the table, which lands right next to the bad leaf. Suddenly, all the black stuff on it disappears. Well, what do you know? This stuff wakes. Galadriel and Theo try to make it back to the others. The boy wants to fight, but the elf tells him it's not going to do any good. The land is gone, and she takes the blame for it. The Numenorians and surviving men retreat through the woods. Elendil sees Berek the horse being led away, but it's not Isildur doing the leading. Melendil and Muriel arrive, and the captain immediately notices something wrong. If Isildur's not with them and not with his horse, well, we saw what happened. But since this is a prequel, we know we'll see him again eventually. Further back, Theo is bemoaning the loss of everyone he knew, but Galadriel tells him not to dwell on things he doesn't know. He thinks it's great she killed so many orcs, but the elf says never to relate good with killing like that. She then hands him her sword, saying he may make a soldier yet. As they walk up the ridge where the camp is, Elendil notices that the queen isn't reacting to things right near her. When she asks when they'll finally get out of the smoke, he replies it's been a mile. It's clear Muriel can no longer see, or at least not very well. She insists they keep going so the people will not lose confidence. Back in the glade, Sadik tries talking to the giant, telling him he's not sure how he can help him with the whole star thing. As they walk by a tree, a flower starts to grow. The stranger is about to leave when Nori tries to give him an apple to eat along the way. 
Then we get a nicely framed callback to Da Vinci's Dawn of Man, the one they had at the beginning of Ben Hur. You know when you zoom in on it. I wonder if he can do any filming in the Sistine Chapel these days with phones. You know, I get why they don't want to use flash cameras. Anyway, he takes the apple and walks away. Nori tells her mother she shouldn't have gotten involved with him and how it messed everything up. Next, we get a momentous occasion in the series. Galadriel actually names her brother. The writer was a story editor on a whole bunch of other shows. I guess he realized they have to get the name out eventually. But then she says she also lost her husband, Celeborn, to the enemy. She talks about how they met, and it not only calls back to when Baron first saw Luthien, but how Tolkien first saw his wife-to-be, Emily. So a nice tip of the hat there. She says he went off to war in not very good fitting armor, and she never saw him again. But we did. He was the guy kind of behind Kate Blanchett when we first see her in Fellowship of the Ring. So there's another character we'll know we'll be seeing again, or in this case, for the first time, whenever he shows up. Theo then takes the blame for all of this since he gave the bad guys the sword, but Galadriel tells him he did it out of love, not evil. When he asks how he can move forward, she replies he has to trust that there's a design out there for all of this, but she can't see it yet. Some orcs come by, but they manage to stay hidden and quiet enough for them to leave. Durin and Elrond have decided to go digging for Mithril on their own. During a break, the elf admits he threw the contest so they could talk a little while longer. The dwarf mentions it's important in their world to be worthy of a father's name, though in this case, he probably shouldn't have had it through no fault of his own, and gets ready to tell him his secret name in his own language, but Elrond tells him to hold off. They continue digging and find a cave full of Mithril. Unfortunately, just at that moment, the king arrives and throws Elrond out of the caves. The king then tells his son about his very difficult time after birth where he could barely breathe. But he saw in him the faces of the old king, so he knew he'd make it. But instead of taking solace in what his father's saying, the prince says he's condemning their people to cling to the past and allowing allies to die. But it's when he calls Elrond his brother as much as any child from his mother's womb, all that does it. The king removes the royal neck piece and basically tells him he's not prince anymore. Of all the things on the show that could possibly relate to the modern world, throwing out royal family members is probably the closest one. Nori wakes up and sees Poppy eating the last apple. She panics, but her friend tells her not to worry. She looks and the field is now bursting with life. There's fruits, vegetables, grains, loaves, fishes, the whole nine yards. Turns out the big guy fixed things after all. But when Poppy goes down to the water, she notices a big footprint that's not the one from the guy she knows. She drops the bucket in the water and runs away. The bucket then ends up the feet at those three weirdos in white. That night, Nori sees them touching a tree. I guess that's a thing with everybody. And finds that first flower that bloomed when they walked by originally. When the three go to leave, she runs out and tells them they're going the wrong way. See, she can do a Gene Hackman imitation. She points the right way, but then they're gone. But suddenly they're right next to her. Her mother and father and Sada come out of the woods with torches to protect her, but the head guy, girl, thing touches the torch and puts it out with cold. Huh. Sounds like someone else we know. He, she, it then blows the embers off his hand, and the whole caravan starts on fire. In the Numenorian camp, the soldiers try to get control of one horse but can't. Elendil comes over to Beric and calms him down. After a moment, he decides to let him go, and the horse runs off. He then says he regrets saving Galadriel for all the damage it's caused. At that point, she and Theo reach the camp. He looks into some of the tents of the healing and sees a lot of dead and wounded. He thinks he finds his mother dead under a sheet, but Bronwyn comes in behind him, followed by Arendir. The stoically emotional kid hugs them both. Galadriel then goes to see the queen and takes the blame for everything that happened. The now blind woman reaches out and realizes the elf has a kind face, but to remain ticked off at the enemy, because even though she's leaving now, as someone once put it, she shall return. 
The Harfoots try to put things back together, and Nori's dad, Largo, is trying to get the folks moving again. Anybody notice his leg got better really fast? You know, maybe he's the one that's Logan. Sadik wants everybody to have a good cry, but Monsieur Lago will have none of it. That inspires Nori to go off and find the big guy. Poppy joins her, then her mother, then Sadik has volunteered to lead them into the woods. The Numenorians begin their voyage back home. The men who can travel will go to Pelagir, an old outpost. All of a sudden, everyone remembers we haven't seen the king all episode. He's been badly wounded, but is still alive. Barely. Somehow he's able to get up, walk around, and get onto a horse. But everyone's happy to still see him alive. The Southlands will rise again, they think. Durin and Disa try to sort out what their future holds. They will rule the Kinglin, and they'll get the Mithril to save their friends. The king commands the cave be sealed and tosses the cured leaf into the cave. It floats down the Mithril vein, down, down, down until it wakes up a Balrog. Maybe that's why the king was a tad worried. Back by the volcano, everything still looks red, while Adar and his gang are searching the village. They proclaim Adar is Lord of the Southlands, but it's not the Southlands anymore. As we see on the screen, as Mount Doom continues erupting in the background, the name Southlands gets burned out and replaced with the name Mordor. So this episode, we get the fallout of doing something when you're not quite ready to do it. It's actually kind of similar to the Civil War in the MCU. You had people doing the wrong thing for the right reason and the right thing for the wrong reasons. And in this case, it's the exact same action going to save the people in the Southland. You know, one group of people want to do it for one reason, one want to do it for another, and it's a mess. It does seem this episode had a lot of cleanup to placate some of the criticisms that it wasn't sticking to Tolkien. I'd been wondering what happened to Celeborn since he was there in Lord of the Rings. I guess somewhere along the way we'll be seeing him since he and Galadriel head to Lothlorien before Numenor disappears in the final battle with Sauron. They finally got Fenrod's name out there and also gave a sort of kind of explanation of why we have two Dorns in a row, since he had the face of the old kings. It stretched, but at least they gave an attempt. Pelagir, the town the survivors are going to, becomes a haven for the faithful, and later an important city in Gondor, so that's getting set up. We're still not sure who the big guy is, and who the white dudes are, and why they want him. The fact he brings life, not death, you know, kind of like Arthur after drinking from the Holy Grail, must mean he can't be the real incarnation of evil. Can it? There's also some more Christian imagery, you know, that which was dead will return to life. But is the apple hearkening back to the other end of the Bible? You know, for a show that people were worried about being too woke, there's a lot of religious symbolism in here. Next time, it's the season finale, and we'll see what they reveal now and what they'll hold off until later. We know at least one character will come back eventually, maybe more. Please hit the subscribe button wherever you're hearing us. I'm John Harcher. Thanks for listening.